So welcome, bienvenidos to today's Core Coffee Chat, featuring tips on how to craft a grant budget. I'm Nicole Lezen, one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or Core Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your hosts today. As you can hear, our Core Institute events are held bilingually in English with Spanish interpretation. Today, Stella Lauerman is providing simultaneous interpretation and Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now. And she'll also translate your comments and questions in the chat. The barking you hear in the background is Pico, my dog who you'll be hearing more about later. <laughs> All righty, with that, I will turn it over to Nicole Young, who's going to give us a brief overview of CORE, and then we'll dive into budget details. Thanks, Nicole. So CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it started off as a funding model that's used primarily by the county and city of Santa Cruz. And over the last several years, it's evolved into much more than that. It's really a funding model and a movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And so you'll see on the next slide that that evolution of CORE has been fueled by input and insights that we've gathered along the way from many partners and organizations like you. Uh, and that helped us develop this mission and vision for CORE investments that really centers safety, healthy communities, equitable opportunities, a thriving, resilient community, and again, with equity at the center. And when we say equitable health and well-being, uh, we mean that we want to uh, reach a place where all people across the lifespan in all areas of our county have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interconnected core conditions for health and well-being. Uh, and that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse based on things like race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, income level, and so on. And so when we think of CORE as both a funding model and a movement, it really provides us a framework to align our priorities, our programs, our practices, our policies, and really work together towards uh, improving conditions and well-being at a community level. So on the next slide, you'll see that events like today's CORE Coffee Chat and other trainings are offered under the umbrella of the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. And this is really just a way for us to offer an array of learning opportunities for people across sectors, different types of organizations to again, build some common language and skills and practices. And so we are very pleased to have all of you joining us here today. And we've got a poll that we want to start off with just to get a sense of uh, what your experience is with preparing budgets. Would you say that you have none and you're a complete newbie to this? Are you someone who has some experience, you've dipped your toe into grants and budgets, you have a lot, it's part of your job and you've prepared multiple budgets, or would you say it's extensive, it's all you do every day? So we'll give everyone just a moment to answer the poll. And it looks like everyone has participated. Oh, maybe give it one more, couple more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and then we'll see what the results look like. So we have a fair number of people with, um, about half the group have a lot of experience. And then kind of a, a smattering of none, some, and extensive. So we will, I think, have a good discussion today. And Nicole, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Nicole. And hi, everyone. I'm glad to know there's a, a mix of experiences because we're going to go over some basics of uh, proposal budgets. But we're also really welcoming your input. So if you have additional tips and strategies and, of course, questions, please keep them coming throughout the chat. And we'll have some time afterwards to try to address them. And Gisela has just placed um, a, a link to the slides that I'm about to go over in the chat so if you'd like to follow along as well. 
So today, we're going to start off with just a general overview of proposal budgets, and then we're going to talk about some common budget categories like personnel and fringe benefits, travel, equipment, supplies, contracts or subcontracts that you may have as part of your, your grant budget, construction when that's allowed, and that all-purpose other category, which can really come in handy. And several of you had questions when you registered for today's session about indirect charges, so we'll try and address those as well. And then we'll also talk about budget narratives, which accompany the, the numerical budgets in a lot of proposals. So we'll try to share tips along the way on each of these topics, and again, encourage you to chime in as well. So proposal budgets are generally from a funder trying to get information from you, the applicant, about what a project is going to cost in different ways. So how realistic are your costs? They wanna know if you are not just uh, lowballing an estimated, estimated budget to, um, to use their funds or the, to compete with others who are applying for their funds, to know that you have a sense of what it's actually gonna to take to accomplish what you're proposing, and that you have coverage for the costs that you anticipate, not just from them, but possibly from your own budget, from other funders, and that you have um, a sense for them about what their funding is going to support as a proportion of a total project budget. So all of these things may not be asked explicitly in the proposal or in the budget questions, but they're the kinds of things that you have an opportunity to communicate in both a numeric budget and the uh, budget narrative, as we'll discuss in just a moment. So just as with proposal writing in general, knowing your funder's budget requirements is really important. This may seem basic or not even worth saying, but it's amazing how often there's something tucked into those budget instructions that um, is a restriction that's hiding in there. Um, you just don't want to miss any of those um, restrictions or requirements because they'll cost you points on a competitive application. So if the funder has included a budget template as part of the request for proposal or RFP, which is often the case, make sure you're aligned with it. Often those are offered as guidance. You can add a category or adapt a category that's specific to your project, but it's a good starting point and it can show you what they most wanna know. And also if other applicants are using the same template, it makes it much easier for reviewers to compare one budget to another. If there are some specific requirements, just make sure that you've noted those upfront. It can be something like a limit to an indirect cost rate, which we'll talk about in just a minute. It could be some documentation that's connected to the budget. So it could be, have you been audited um, as a nonprofit by an outside accounting firm? Or if you have a memorandum of understanding or MOU with a partner for this project and you're exchanging funds for that purpose, is that required as part of the, the proposal um, when funds are changing hands? There are also very common restrictions that depend on the type of funder. So for example, federal funders, for a variety of reasons that don't make a lot of sense to me, no longer allow you to purchase food for meetings. Just don't get me started on that one. But you also may have restrictions on purchasing equipment or the kinds of um, contributions to capital campaigns, to payments to individuals are often restricted. Um, all kinds of lobbying and advocacy can be restricted in kind of boilerplate funding language. So just make sure that you know what is and isn't allowed as you're starting the budget process and not waiting for the very end when it's harder to fix things and adjust the narrative with it. So some basic things about answering the question of what will the project cost? If you are the person preparing both the budget and the project narrative for this proposal, which sometimes happens, or if it's separate people who are doing those two tasks, it's really great to have coordination from the start, even if you're coordinating with yourself. So for example, you may be starting to think about how staff are required, how much of their time is going to be needed, what else do those staff need to succeed, what, what other items might be on your wish list. Maybe there's something that you're not sure will fit in the budget, 
um, maybe it's an upgrade of something, a, a laptop or, or um, a new um, mobile van to, to take your services to where they're needed. Those may or may not fit, but keep a running tab so that you know um, you'll have an opportunity to fit some of those things in at the end if the rest of your pro project budget allows for those kinds of adjustments. And then you'll also want to be thinking about who you're partnering with and whether they need some financial support from, from this budget as well. So all of those things are important to be thinking about ahead of time, just because they will shape the scope of your project and they will need adjustments as you go along. Um, there, there are things that might be needed um, even for services that are so-called free or donated, like a partner's involvement or volunteers, because they may still need things like training, coordination and oversight from your team, supplies or transportation. The, the rule of thumb is that the more you can anticipate upfront, the better. It doesn't mean that you should expect to have a perfect budget at the outset, but at least you'll have something that you can adjust to along the way. And that can be really hard. Those adjustments are really hard at the end. If you suddenly realize you have to cut, for example, staffing in half or, or something that drastic, which can happen. So moving on to some common budget categories, even though every proposal budget is annoyingly unique in some way, they mostly ask for costs in these categories, some exceptions, may apply, but as we've just discussed, um, personnel and fringe, that, so that those are the benefits that go with the, the salaries of your personnel, are typically the largest or one of the largest components of most proposals for services. And usually those are expressed, as we'll see in just a moment, as a percentage of each staff member's time. So is it half time, a quarter time, full time, et cetera? And then fringe benefits are calculated as a percentage of that, of the salary time. Again, that's usually a percentage of, that's, that applies either across the board to all staff or might have some differentiation based on the staff categories. And then um, you might have some things like travel to attend a conference or a training, and that has some subcomponents to it too. You might have equipment like computer equipment or tablets for your staff or for the clients they're serving. You might need supplies that are associated with that equipment like printer cartridges or easels for meetings. Um, if you are working with different kinds of partners, you might have subcontracts for them or maybe for a consultant to do an evaluation or to help you with some communications or planning strategies. There are all kinds of ways that contracts can be included um, in a project budget. And so that's a little different from having, for example, a, a partner. That's another area to be careful because some funders um, have a different idea of what constitutes a subcontract and whether it can be a certain proportion of the funding or not. So just take note of that as you're reading through the requirements. Construction, sometimes allowed, sometimes not. Those are typically really huge expenses. So often there are proposals that are geared just to that type of funding. Um, and sometimes they require a different kind of budget because there are things like estimates from builders or types of supplies. So another place to just um, understand what is being asked. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that other category is really handy for things that don't fit into any other category naturally. So things like um, if you're able to pay stipends for people who participate in events for you, um, if you are offering childcare and transportation to make it easier for people to attend your events and trainings, that's a great place for those kinds of things to, to fit. Um, if snacks and refreshments are allowed, they can go into this other category as well. Well, some of you asked in your registration questions about indirect charges. Indirect charges are the ones that cover things like the rent for your organization's office space, human resources, accounting. Um, they're the, the kinds of costs that you need to keep operating day to day, but they don't necessarily accrue to a particular initiative or project, and therefore they are shared across different budgets um, across the organization. Some funders require you to have 
a, a calculated indirect rate that is um, formulated by somebody going through your books and figuring out exactly what that percentage is, um, usually an accounting firm. Sometimes they realize that not every nonprofit has gone through the expense and trouble to do that. And so they'll allow a rate that is a little lower than it might be otherwise if you had done that, but you're still allowed to use it without documentation. And sometimes that you can say, we're working on it, we're not there yet. And they'll allow that as a, um, we think it's 10% or 12%. So there are different ways that that's calculated. And then there are different ways that it can, that it's allowed to be a percentage of all the other costs. Sometimes we see that people are tempted to skip an indirect line item because it feels like it's too much trouble or might get you in trouble. Um, I would just say that whenever possible, you should charge indirect rates um, to whatever is allowed. Funders need to know that nonprofits need to incur these costs in order to keep operating, and you are entitled to them. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, so there, there is a school of thought about that, that they're tricky or suspect in some way, and I just um, I think they're very standard, and I would encourage you to either learn about what's required from a funder, but not to shy away from charging them in your budgets because they are an important part of um, keeping an organization running. So a tip again is to make friends with a spreadsheet and we're gonna make friends with a particular spreadsheet um, in just a moment. It doesn't matter whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet or something else that you use, but probably not an abacus or a calculator, although these can be helpful for checking um, your figures. Spreadsheets, if you're not as familiar with them or comfortable with them, are a great tool, not only for accuracy, although they still need human input and human eyes on them, but also because they allow you to do what if scenarios. And these are so handy in grants because you're constantly asking yourself, what if I added a staff member? What if our intern could join us on that trip to that conference? What if we served 50 more people or 75 more people in that venue? So once you have your spreadsheet set up, it's really easy to run those scenarios in terms of just some different assumptions and see what the ripple effect is all the way through your budget. And that way you can get um, something that is both accurate and reflects um, the true costs of doing your project. All right, so let's practice. Some of you have met my office mate and canine overlord, Princess Pico, shown here <laughs> on one of her hikes. Um, there, I will say there are some core coffee chat recordings that feature some very distracting and destru destructive Pico behavior right behind me here. I won't tell you which those are. You have to go hunt them down for yourself. But um, today we're going to borrow Pico's worldview for a hypothetical proposal budget and work through it. And I know she'd approve. She's actually <laughs> snoozing at this moment. So we'll try and keep it that way. It's better for everybody. Um, so Pico wants you to know that many humans just don't realize that there's a profound need for more dog biscuits everywhere and longer walks every day. Pico has found a funder who agrees that something should be done. And that funder has issued an RFP for exactly these priorities. I mean, it does happen sometimes. It's amazing when you find a funder who is willing to fund exactly what you think is important. So Pico has proposed a project in which clueless humans like me are sent to a conference to learn how to start a dog biscuit bakery so that's what we're going to prepare a budget for. I'm going to stop sharing slides and switch to sharing a Google Sheet. And Gisela is going to put that link in the chat. And I'm going to find my spreadsheet, which I had up just a moment ago. Excuse me one second. Okay, there it is.
Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see this. So we're gonna ask you just for now not to manipulate the numbers in here while we tour it, but after the chat, you're welcome to download this and use it for your own purposes if it's helpful to you. And while it is in, in a Google Sheet, it's very much the same functions as th that you'd find in an Excel spreadsheet. The difference is that in a Google Sheet, multiple people can access it more easily. At the bottom of this spreadsheet, you should see some additional tabs, and those allow you to navigate to the same thing that we're looking at now in Spanish. And then when we get to some of the budget detail, you can see that in Spanish as well. If you're not familiar with those tabs at the bottom, they are a way to create additional pages or worksheets that are linked to this main one on the first page. And that's a really another really handy thing because a lot of project budgets just require line items like these. And it's a, a way to provide additional detail that then can be referred to in a budget narrative and again, can help you play with those assumptions. So I'm gonna go through this in more detail. If you'd like to follow along with me, you can follow on your screen or on this screen share. So we're on the main project budget page. So it should look like what you're seeing on the screen. And on this page, you can see the main budget categories that we discussed earlier, personnel, fringe, travel, et cetera. And while I'm not gonna get into it today, in columns E and F, you can see that you have an opportunity to add in kind and then come up with a total. In kind means something that you're donating to the project. So maybe, for example, your staff, um, your CEO of your organization is gonna oversee the project but isn't going to charge a line item of their salary to it. You would put that in in kind to demonstrate that you are devoting some time and resources to this but are not officially asking the funder to cover them. So that's a nice way. Um, maybe you're donating a facility for some events. Sometimes it's required, but often it's just a show of here are some things that we are also doing in addition to support the project. And sometimes it comes from other sources like partners. So you can just keep adding columns for other things that are being added to the project to get to a total. But today for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna deal with what we're asking the funder to do for Pico's Dog Biscuit project. So let's look at each of these a little more closely. Under personnel, you'll see that we are proposing, um, we're seeking funding for three different staff for this project, a project manager, a lead dog walker, and a baking assistant. And this is a tremendously egalitarian organization. So they each make the exact same salary. Remember, this is a made up example, but it makes the math easier for us too. So even though they make the same salary, they're working different percentages of their time. The manager is only in the picture about 5% of their time, while the dog walker needs to devote at least half their time, 50% to this important venture. And to make sure that the biscuits are available on demand, we need the baking assistant to be available to work on this for about 75% of their time, almost full time. As you can see, these percentages are in a different column. I'm highlighting it now. And that's just showing you that it's a percentage of what would be full time. So 5%, 50%, 75%. And then um, we apply those percentages to the salaries that are in the column to the left of that to get the number that we're requesting. So you can see here, this is just the formula is taking B2, which is the salary of 50,000, times C2, which is 5%. And that's how we get $2,500 for that person for the project manager's time and ditto for the ones below. The lead dog, walk, dog walker is half of 50,000 or 25,000. And the baking assistant is 75% of 50,000 or 37.5. And then we have a subtotal for those three numbers because we are gonna apply this fringe benefit, one third percentage right here, to that 65 number to get at the fringe benefit calculation. So 33%, not of all of their salaries, just the portions that we are seeking from the funder. And that comes to another 
$21,450 that you can see in cell D7. So um, formulas are a really great time saver, but they're not magically error free. So I'll, I'll reemphasize this later too. Um, it's really good practice to check those formulas, make sure they're calculating exactly what you want them to calculate, no more and no less. But just last week, I was working on a budget for someone. Several different people were working on it, and someone added an item after the last line and did not reflect that in the formula. And so that number was omitted from the total, um, but we caught it in time. It does happen. So then as we move down in our budget, you can see that there's a number highlighted, 2858, $2,858 for travel to attend a conference. So now I'll ask you to move over to the tab that says project uh, de budget detail in English or Spanish. And we're gonna show you how that 2858 number was created. So here it is on your screen. This has project detail for travel and for supplies. So for the travel part, we want two staff to attend that dog bakery conference where they'll be trained to make better dog biscuits. And th these are all just made up numbers, but there's airfare for two people. There's some ground transportation like Ubers or Lyfts. There's airport parking. They're gonna stay in a hotel. They're gonna have some meals. So you can estimate, or maybe you know exactly what those costs are. And then, so those are listed in column B. And then in column C, we run through our scenario. So this is two people times one airfare, right? Two times 700 is 1400. Ground transportation is that $50 times two people times three days, and so on. But the really cool thing about these, um, these additional sheets that you can create by clicking the little plus sign in the lower left corner is you can then link this 2858 number into the main spreadsheet. So here, when I click on that 2858, it says budget detail, which is the name of that other worksheet, and cell C9, which is where we just were. What that means is that if I change anything in that detailed budget, more people are attending the conference, the airfares go up, we decide we need to spring for more hotel rooms, it automatically will pipe in here to our main budget. So moving on, um, we are going to have to buy a fancy custom oven. So that's in the equipment line here. And I can tell you from our internal testing that underbaked, perfectly baked, and overbaked dog biscuits are all A plus to Pico. She doesn't care, but we still need that oven. And you saw the same detail on the budget sheet, on the budget detail sheet about what makes up the supplies number, which was some ingredients. And again, that one is piped in from the budget detail. And the advantage of that is you can change it elsewhere without cluttering this main budget, which is. Um, what, what's often required, just the line items. And then for contracts, we've just added some detail here, the dog walkers, the kitchen rental, and the social media publicist, because this is another way to do it. Sometimes you, you are asked to provide the, the detail right under the main category like this. So you can do it either way. It can be elsewhere and then reflected here as just one simple line or more detailed with a subtotal. Just, and it can be that way different, done differently for different categories. It just depends on what the funder's example is and what, you, what kind of detail you think is important. So we have some other um, canine taste testers in our other category. We don't have any construction, so we've said zero there. No. And then we sub, sorry? Sorry, I had my hand raised and I had a question. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see your hand there. Go ahead, Audrey. So going back to the to the uh, travel conference and how that's linked to yeah. the budget detail. So when you're on the budget detail sheet, 
Are you copying um, a specific uh, command to get that? So is it um, the paste special and values only, format only, and then you uh, paste that into the other spreadsheet? How is it linked? I'll show you how I do it. I think with spreadsheets, there are always a couple of different ways. So I do shift plus, and that tells the that tells it that something's coming. And then I go to budget detail and I go here and I hit return. That's a new one. I've never done that one before. The way that I do it is to paste value special. So thank you for sharing that tip. You're welcome. And thank you for sharing yours too. I, I think, you know, this is one of those things where whatever is more comfortable to you. Um, but for me, the shift plus go to the place that you want to appear in this cell and then return. Mm -hmm. It's, it's automatic. Okay. So just do so, shift plus and then go to this, go to the, the sheet and then just click into the cell that is connecting to. Yeah. And okay. then hit return to make it to close the deal. Okay. And so you. both of these are exactly the same. You can see here, it's saying mm -hmm. budget detail worksheet and then go to cell C9. Mm -hmm. Nicole, do you do it a different way or anybody else? Yeah, I do the pay special. <laughs> okay. Yeah, pay special uh, and uh, using a link to the cell where it's coming from. Okay. But I think it's it's doing the same thing as what you just showed. Yeah. Yeah. And the shortcut when you do values only, it says Control Shift V oh. as a shortcut for the okay. pay special for values only. Yeah, we could do a um, a whole session just on shortcuts, and maybe we will. <laughs> they're they're just are different ones. I think if you paste the values only, I'm not sure. Audrey, are you saying that it then? Mm -hmm. when you maintains um, that link to yes. the original so cell when you, yeah when you do pay special and you click values only then you just go back to the to the sheet where you want that to be and then you just paste it in there then uh click and then just do paste control v and it'll copy it in there there you go okay i learned something thank you So, so one difference, Audrey, is that when you do that, you just have the number. So that's um, great. No, if the it, number it never should came. also it should also identify where it came from. Mm -hmm. But it didn't do that for me. I think if huh. you paste the value only, it's just putting in the number. If you want it to maintain the link. Um, Yeah, to, to the original value. cell. And Google Sheets might be a little bit different than Excel in terms of the options that are. Yeah, so I would just say, um, so just do that with caution in the sense of if you want it to link to something that is um, potentially going to change, and that's the, part of the reason for doing this is so that you can play with those numbers and make them all fit. So for example, if you're trying to hit a particular target with your budget, you know the funder is going to give you $100,000 and you're at 90 and you're saying, what else can we do? To just, we don't want to leave $10,000 on the table and just keep kind of nudging it up to $100,000. That's a way that you can play with those details and say, what if I added this or that? But if you if you don't have a link to the cell, then it won't repopulate. Um, okay. It won't update. So just be just do that with caution. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, though. Any other questions at this moment? Okay, I'm going to move down here. So I was starting to say that um, now we've listed all these things. We've got some that are um, imported from other places. We've got some that are detailed here. And now what we want to do is get a subtotal of all of those, what they're called direct charges. So on this spreadsheet, that would be all of the things that are lined in bold. So personnel, fringe, travel, equipment, supplies, contracts. And for contracts, it would be this subtotal. Uh, 
for personnel, it's the subtotal as well. Other, and then um, I just did plus each of those cells. And so when you do this in a spreadsheet, as opposed to with a calculator, then if you have inserted other lines elsewhere, these should automatically um, adjust, but you want to eyeball it and double check because weird things can happen. So just make sure that, that just nothing funky has happened with what's in this category because it's, it's a really important feeder to your total budget number. Some people set up their budget to have subtotals kind of off to the side, one column over. That makes it really easy to sum them up. I just happen to do it this way. Um, and so we know for this funder that we're allowed to charge 10% in indirect on those other direct charges. Some funders have restrictions on what you can charge indirect costs on. So for example, they might have a, a ceiling, like if you are hiring uh, a subcontractor, you can only charge indirects on a portion of that. Their reasoning is that you're charging indirects for all those things, rent, HR, accounting, that the consultant may or may not even need or use. And so you're not really incurring those kinds of charges for a subcontract or for the majority of a subcontract. So um, just make sure again that you're, in this case, we think we can charge 10% on all the direct charges. So we have done that. So you can see that that's 10% of 123,933, which comes out to 12,393, $12,393. $12, then we add these two numbers together, the subtotal of the direct charges and the indirect charges to get our grand total for the project. That's, this is what we're seeking from the funder. There may be other things that we are seeking from another partner or funder. There might be other costs that we are donating to this project or incurring for the project. They don't all have to be donated. Maybe you've got a line item for some staff time, but you can show those in those other columns. This number is the one that's gonna be in our budget narrative for this funder. So, any questions before we leave the world of spreadsheets here? Well, I know that sometimes uh, funders will actually say, like, here's the maximum amount that you can apply for. And so, um, like, that has to include the indirect. And so sometimes it just means, like, you go back and forth, back and forth, adjusting your direct costs <clears throat> so that your indirect... <laughs> doesn't put you over the max amount or so do you want to say more about that too? Cause that's. Yeah. Uh... Thanks for that reminder. Yeah. That can be tricky, especially at the very end. So that situation I mentioned where, you know, if you happen to know what the, what the funder um, is, what, what their max amount is and that you, and you have decided strategically to go for that max amount, then um, you really want to nail it. You don't want to be $10 over or a hundred dollars over, and you don't want to be way under either. So to get to that number, as Nicole is saying, you have to back out. Um, you can't just add costs without considering the indirect um, implications. So you wanna make sure that that number includes the indirects and when you're making adjustments that you allow for that wiggle. Um, and I'm sure there's a formula to do that. But... Any math whizzes out there? X minus one times one point, whatever. I know how to add it in. I just don't know how to take it back out. <laughs> but I'm sure we can figure that out. So if you're, if you're new to spreadsheets, it sounds like many of you have budget experience, which is great. But if you're new to budgets and spreadsheets, um, spending some time with an Excel or a Google Sheets tutorial or both, is really worth your time. There, there's just a handful of things that, you know, how to use some, some pretty um, common formulas that will really um, save you many, many, many hours later on. So I encourage you to do that. And there are lots of good ones out there. But as you've just seen, there are also multiple ways to get the same thing done. So 
the way that you learn it might be the way you do it for the next few decades. So, <laughs> and then you can't unlearn those things, but they all work. Some just might be more cumbersome than others. Does anybody have a favorite Excel or Google Sheet tip you want to share? Yeah, us as Neil, I've got one. Great. Go ahead, Neil. Well, you, you were looking back at where you're adding up a lot of things. Yeah. And so one thing you can do is if you click on that on that cell, that that one, two, three, and now click up at the top where all the where the formula is, it shows you by color what's in that oh. sum. Oh, very cool. That okay. way you can look, have a visual to make sure you got everything. Awesome. I did not know that. Love that. Anybody else? Neil, does that work in Excel? Do you know? Yeah, same thing in Excel. Same thing. Cool. Okay, let's go back to our slides. This was just a summary of what we just did, the link. And again, if you want to um, download that Google Sheet and just use it with, with some of what's already in there, feel free. And if you do get funded to make dog biscuits, let me know. Okay, so a tip we've already alluded to is um, how important it is to align your project narrative and work plan with your budget. So um, if, if you're doing all of this, great, that makes it a little easier, but not necessarily. Um, but it helps to just start out with some initial guesstimates, um, check in frequently with whoever's doing the narrative and the work plan. Um, just try to think about the reviewers looking at this. Does it make sense to somebody who doesn't know as much about this as you do um, that it's gonna take this many staff, it's gonna require these kinds of materials? Have you really told the story of your project as best you can given the budget format that they have? And you, this might be a place where if you are um, the person responsible, it sounds like many of you are for both the budget and uh, a project narrative, or even just the budget, which is a heavy lift often by itself, it is certainly possible to delegate some of that research. Maybe somebody can help you figure out um, some updated pricing for different things that are in there or chase down MOUs and subcontractor budgets from partners, which are sometimes hard to get on time. So there's, there's all kinds of um, tasks associated around the budget that may be more than just putting things into a spreadsheet. Um, and there's a lot of thinking behind each of those lines, as you can see, and adjustments. And there are often twists, even for the most basic budget. We mentioned in-kind donations and how you can add those as a column to be reflected alongside your, um, the, the funds that you're seeking. Maybe some other funders are chipping in, so you'd wanna show some of that. We just did a one-year budget for Project PICO, but often there are multi-year budgets. Sometimes you're allowed to vary the funding over time, which is helpful because there might be a different level of startup costs, for example, or maybe you're ramping up and you have an initial lower budget cost while people are getting trained and settled. And then you're going to start seeing clients and providing services, and it's going to cost more. So those budgets might need to be look a little different from each other year to year. There might be salary increases um, that are expected that work into each year, each successive year of the budget. It's not always possible, but when it is, that can make it more complicated, but also more accurate. Some funders want you to show the revenue that your project is bringing in. So for example, if you are drawing down matching funds from a federal or state program, they'd want you to show that. 
Maybe you're charging for something that you're doing, a nominal fee or an offset of some kind, like for training. And that would show up in your budget as well. And then you'd have something that looks like what we just did for Project Pico, that's all expenses, but would also have some income from selling dog biscuits and renting out dog walking time. And that would offset the, the costs as well. So just like we said for the proposal narrative itself, check, double check, triple check the numbers. Um, as we mentioned, eyeballing the major categories. Thanks, Neil, for that great tip that will help do that. Check every single formula, especially if more people are involved in uh, a Google Sheet than, than you. Um, but even if it's just you, mistakes happen. We're all human. Um, build in some review time. And if you have an opportunity to ask for help from a fresher pair of eyes that hasn't been up late working on the proposal, that's always really helpful to have somebody say, well, wait a minute. If you're making dog biscuits, don't you need some flour and peanut butter? <laughs> so just, um, just to think like a reviewer, but to do it from an, a slightly outside perspective can be really helpful for both the narrative and the budget. And of course, to, to crosswalk between the two. So one last way that you can do that and make your pitch for the reasonableness and efficiency of your budget is the budget narrative. And it's just what it sounds like. It's um, an opportunity to use just a few words, a sentence or two for each category usually, to explain those questions we'd started out with. What the project's gonna cost, how realistic those costs are, how, how you're planning to cover them, and how much you're requesting from this particular funder. It's not an essay, it's not another proposal. So don't go on and on, but just um, do take the opportunity to say a little more about what you're doing because a lot of the costs that you've put into the budget may not be self-evident to a reviewer who's not as familiar with what you're doing. And here's an example. Oops, there we go. Here's an example. Sometimes I just lift the personnel um, lines directly from the spreadsheet and as a reminder, especially if there's no space restriction, and then just explain it a little a little more. So in this case, we have um, some more information, some more information about the, um, the staff line items. So we're gonna explain that we have three staff um, devoted to this and it's an opportunity to um, to have more detail, but also to indulge in some terrible puns if, if you're so inclined. So we have uh, Maya Dog Rules, we have Trail Love, we have a more cookie please, right Pico? As our staff here, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. And um, you just do that for each of the main categories. And sometimes that's attached to the project narrative, sometimes it's a separate document, but often it's an opportunity that's included in proposals. And so take advantage of it because it's some people read numbers more easily than others and are drawn more to the, the text explanation. So it's just a way that you can do both. All righty. Um, to recap really quickly, be prepared to answer these questions with your budget about the costs and how reasonable they are. And just, again, make sure you know the funder's requirements, know your way around a spreadsheet, align often to your narrative and work plan, and double check, triple check everything, numbers and pros. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. And then while you're asking those, I just wanted to put these grant writing resources up. They'll be included in the slides as well. Um, these have a lot of detail about every aspect of proposal writing, including budgets. So let me get back to our chat and see if there are any questions. Or any I may have missed, Nicole. Or feel free to raise your hand. I don't see any new questions in the chat. Okay. In that case, just since we're running short on time at the end of the day, turn it back over to Nicole to go over our roster for the rest of the month. Thanks everybody and good luck.
Thanks, Nicole. So we have on this slide here a list of all the core institute events that are going to be happening in June. Uh, and so uh, Gisela is going to put a link in the chat that actually will take you to the core website where you can review the descriptions of each one of these. There are links uh, to register. All of these will be held on Zoom. So the registration is actually through Zoom. Um, or you can scan the QR code at the top of the slide if you want to go to the web page. Uh, but we're hosting a variety of events in June. Some of them are coffee chat style like this. So the first ones coming up are on June 7th and 9th. Same content, just choose one session or the other where we'll review how to use the Promising Practices database in DataShare uh, and explain how if you're interested in get in submitting any of your programs that your agency provides, if you're interested in trying to get any of them listed in that Promising Practices database, we can offer some help with that. Uh, so we want to make sure everyone has a sense of what that database is and what's required, what information would be required um, to be submitted. So we've got two sessions on that that we're offering, and then offering a series of what we're calling peer learning circles focused on preparing reports for grants for your funders. Um, so we've been focusing on the grant writing and developing budgets in, the, in these last couple coffee chats. Now we're thinking about, especially as we get close to the end of the fiscal year and report writing season begins, um, how to prepare for that report writing. So these will be informal, uh, not really structured training. They're not structured trainings. They're more like office hour style gatherings where we invite, uh, we've selected themes. Um, we've got humble bragging about your grant successes, communicating challenges honestly and constructively, uh, data visualization tips, and then thinking about communicating your results beyond just the funder reports. So we've selected themes, but really it's going to be an opportunity for participants to come with actual questions that they're running into or want some help thinking through. And then we'll use the, the time together to see what ideas or tips or resources um, other participants have. We'll contribute ideas and, and resources as well. Uh, but it's not going to be a structured training. So we really want to uh, think about how, how do we learn together. And then we have the eighth of our uh, workshops in our eight session series on harnessing local data to create the core conditions for stable, affordable housing and shelter. And we're doing that in partnership with DataShare Santa Cruz County, where in each session we focus on a different core condition for health and well being, looked at the data that's available on DataShare, and had some discussions about what story does that data tell, what's missing, how do we use it to um, advance equitable health and well-being in that area. So we've got a lot going on in June. We hope you uh, join us for some or all of those events. And we also are going to ask for your feedback in about today's session. So we've got, um, again, another link here that Giselle has posted in the, in, the, in the chat where you can either fill out a brief survey in English or in Spanish. Or again, if you have your phone in front of you and want to scan the QR code, uh, this is how we're going to be trying to collect our feedback about these coffee chats uh, instead of the Zoom poll. And we do pay attention to the feedback and we learn from it and continuously improve. So we appreciate the time you take to fill that out. We want to just say thank you for being here and we'll see you soon.